All right, welcome back. Episode four of the Higher Up podcast and a special episode because this will be my first ever guest episode. Really excited for the guests we have today for you guys. One of the most motivational individuals I have ever come across in my life. You have probably seen him on your For You page or your Explore page or anywhere you may find motivational content within your algorithm. I found him long before I started creating content and since then he's exploded even more. So I'm honored to have him on. I'm excited to pick his brain and share some of his thoughts and his knowledge and perspectives on life with all of you guys. And I think this will be a really good conversation. So without further ado, Mr. Crew Mahoney, welcome on, man. Happy to have you. Dude, thank you. That intro was way too nice, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all true, man. I, I've been a fan of you since before I started making videos. I remember when we chatted last week, I told you when I was scrolling TikTok and I don't know, I, almost a year ago at this point, I hadn't even put a video out. And that first video of you doing your morning mile, I was like, what? my first thought was, how does he run and look at the camera for that long? <laughs> I would definitely <laughs> yeah. bust my tail. Dude, that I get that a lot. And people, people have said, who's filming you? Like they're thinking someone else is filming me. I'm just holding my phone out in front of myself, but I use the back camera. And so I, I think so clear. I have, yeah, yeah, I have like the, I think I have the 13, the iPhone 13. I think the stabilization is just really good. Uh, and you after a while, you know, your shoulder becomes kind of a gimbal, like you know how to keep <laughs> it still uh, after, you know, a couple hundred days. But yeah, man, it's uh, it's definitely an art, you know? <laughs> yeah, you the, 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 the stability with which you are able to run and speak at that early in the morning is a skill in and of itself. And I think that's hilarious. I always thought you brought like a tripod with you on the run, but you're just <laughs> holding it. Oh yeah, just just the bare phone. But I mean, you know, you go back to the the first video, which the first one I did was day thirteen hundred of running every single day. And so, you know, by that point, I was like, all right, you know, I got to start sharing this because you you kind of get this education that you didn't expect just from being that consistent in this almost isolated uh, attempt to better yourself in a way mm -hmm. um but you know it was day 1300 and filmed my first video and i can assure you it did not look or sound anything like uh the ones you might see in the past few weeks not well, even you've, close you've certainly come a long way since then and that's something we're definitely going to talk about and dive into your your daily morning mile and the video that you post so for those of you that are listening we're going to cover a lot in this episode and i'm going to do my best to just pick Cruz's brain because the way he operates the way he sees life and views the world is something i think a lot of people would benefit from myself included so we're going to talk about just your backstory what got you into this stuff at the level and degree of which you are because it's more than just working out and eating right for you at this point we're going to talk a little bit about your content, what led for to you to even start creating this content, which has now exploded to over yeah. 350,000 strong on TikTok and 300,000 strong on Instagram, which is insane, you know, over half a million eyeballs on you every day. <laughs> um, and then go into like some of the details and the nitty gritty of your training, your nutrition. I know you have a very minimalist approach to it and I love the way you operate in that capacity. So the goal is the same as it is in every episode for you all is to jam pack this with value. And hopefully if you take just one valuable thing from the episode, we'll consider this a win. So if you like this so far, drop a like, drop a comment, and we are going to get into the weeds now. So let's Heck start yeah. with your background, dude. Like who is crew? I, I thought about wanting to know about you and your backstory. And I just thought of who is crew. So tell us about yourself at a high level and how you got started in this stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I think it goes back pretty far just because growing up, I feel like I had this very strong but confusing self-awareness in a way uh you know even in kindergarten i remember being in classes and things and watching how other people interacted and just wondering why people didn't think a certain way or people didn't think the way i did and you know back then it was obviously a very rudimentary understanding of my own thoughts and things and you know i, I talk about a, a mini story sometimes where my grandmother picked me up from school we called her nani and i'm like nani why you know, why, why do I just think different from other people? I don't know what it is, but I feel like, you know, there's, there's just something different. She's like, you know, maybe it's um, like street smarts versus book smarts or something. I was like, yeah, maybe that's what it is, you know? And so it, it really at a, at a beginning level started this intense self-analysis that, you know, obviously I carried throughout my life. And um, in, in terms of, the mentality of things and the discipline and all that sort of stuff. It started 
at the exact opposite. You know, in high school, I was, or, you know, school growing up, up to high school, I was wildly anxious. I mean, you know, you talk about having singularity. I was the complete opposite of that. There was a version of me where, you know, I had confidence, I had self-awareness, I knew the things that I could achieve, but there was the other version of me where under stress, I lost all of that. You know, like every day of middle school, I like cried. I missed uh, 30 full days of sixth grade just from being afraid to go and like being in this place that to me felt so stressful. You know what I mean? It's, it's school, but I, I could not exist in this stress because it felt like this mental trap almost. Um, and so, you know, going from that to where I am now, where I feel like I do have that singularity and, you know, there is, Hey, if I need to be doing something to be better, that's being done currently. You know, if I need to control my mind, control my emotions under stress, that is being done. And nobody's perfect, obviously. We all have times where things don't go how you want them to. But, you know, seeing that transformation from where I was to where I am, uh, you know, really inspires me to help other people understand their ability to do the same exact thing. Because the reality is when somebody is in, you know, that point A that I'm talking about, the, the anxious, maybe it's the depressed person, they see somebody like you and I maybe who's posting about working out and, you know, knows how to speak clearly and discipline, whatever it might be, they see that person as somebody that is just completely separate from them. That's not an attainable thing. That's, oh, that person is just different. That's not a me thing, right? That's, that's a them thing that they know how to control all these things and do whatever. But, you know, trying to get people to understand that that's just decision making you know, point A to point B is just doing certain things that train your mind to get to that point, train your body to get to that point. Um, and so, you know, kind of starting with the morning mile videos and taking that education that I was talking about and trying to translate that into actual helpful messages was really important to me. And, you know, I'm sure you can understand this. We all have kind of our own little language like when I'm talking to me, I know exactly what I mean. But when I'm talking to my phone or I write something down, you know, maybe that doesn't translate perfectly. And so trying to improve my ability to translate that is a really big part of it. Um, and, you know, again, that doesn't always go how you want it to. But I think learning how to have someone else understand what you're talking about is kind of a fun challenge. And so, you know, that's where the start of making the content and really turning it into what it is now started. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you made a really important point in there when you said someone who's maybe depressed, constantly anxious, but just generally or locally depressed or anxious, not dealing with any major massive trauma. They're just, maybe they're a hundred pounds overweight. They never go outside and they feel terrible and they see someone like you and they're never going to guess that you missed a full month of school because of crippling anxiety or mm. the fact that, you know, I was overweight, even obese per doctor's recommendations for most of my life. Yeah. They see, they see us now and they see what got, what we got to, but they don't see how we got here. Right. They appreciate and see the outcome, but they do not see the journey in the process. Yeah. Now, speaking of the journey and the process, 2016 days of a mile a day, every day, and over 700 days of those being recorded with a brief but impactful and profound motivational video. So why run a mile a day every day for 2000 days and why start recording it? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, it might sound cringy. I feel like everybody that does something of a similar amplitude says the same thing, but I started it because I hated to run. I didn't enjoy it. I felt like I was bad at it, but I saw somehow that there was value in facing that. Every time you do on the other side of that is some sort of achievement. You know, the, there's an uptick in kind of a, a resilience and, you know, it's unquantifiable really, which I think is why a lot of people don't focus on these things. Um, but, you know, it, it was because I didn't like it and I figure, you know, why not face this every single day? And uh, where it really started was 30 day challenge with a buddy of mine. Hey, let's just run every single day or run every single morning. Um, I'm the kind of person that 
when I implement something and I see that uptick in the, in the resilience or strength, I have a very hard time going back on that because if I brought myself to a new level, how dare I let myself of yesterday be better than myself of today, right? So, um, you know, day 31 came along and I'm like, what am I going to do? Just not run. <laughs> like I, I do this now. And you so, keep doing it. oh, a hundred percent. And so, you know, kept going with that and, uh, got to about two years and got my wisdom teeth out, which was horrible because they told me you can't exercise for five days. And so that stopped my two year streak. So a week after that, you know, day one, that's the real day one of the 2016 days so far. Um, and yeah, I just never looked back, you know, every single day I figure, well, it's a mile, you know, I can cover a mile. I'm, I'm pretty physically capable. So there should never really be an excuse to not do this unless, you know, my legs stop working or something really horrible happens, which thankfully that has not been the case. Um, I mean, I've, I've thrown up during the run, you know, plenty of things have gone poorly, but, you know, keeping that promise to myself is really the sentiment of the whole thing. You know, it doesn't matter really that it's running or, you know, an ice bath or all these different things. There are direct benefits from these things. Obviously, sure, I'm more confident in running. You know, my baseline cardio is better, all of those. But the thing that people miss is the depth of effort in isolation. You know, we, we know those results of, of being consistent in the physicality of it. But what happens when you keep a promise to yourself 2,000 times? You know, you start to have a certain confidence. You start to have this self-awareness of, oh, okay, you know, I don't have to fall into this limitation mindset that everybody just accepts their downfall. You know, you say, oh, well, I can actually make choices to change my mind. I can become better. And that's wildly tangible. But again, people don't really see that when they're not at that point. Yeah. You, you said something, you alluded to something earlier before we got into this conversation was you said something, the effect of there's a really interesting self-education that occurs through enduring a process like that. And mm. I think that that is something that you cannot explain to someone. They can only experience it for themselves to your point yeah. of, I'm going to bore the people that follow me and listen to me with this quote, but I love Hormozy's take on confidence, which is you don't become confident by shouting affirmations in the mirror, but by having a stack of undeniable proof that you are who you say you are outwork your self doubt. And to your point, I've, I've used the term also in early videos of make agreements with yourself and don't break the agreements because every single action you take is casting a vote for the person you wish to become. That's another great quote that I love from James clear. And whether you realize it or not, every promise you keep to yourself is a small micro win. And every promise you break against yourself is a small micro loss against your confidence. And they accumulate. Yep. And you're, you're spot on, dude. When you keep a promise for 2,000 days and a, a endurance training or running is an easy way to do it, you build this confidence in yourself. And that confidence just bleeds into other facets of your life. Like you said, you start to be able to think, maybe I don't have to accept circumstance X, or maybe I can make decision Y. So there's a ton of power and freedom in building discipline and enduring a task like that. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a fantastic point. Absolutely. Yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, I, I think what's really interesting about it is, you know, we, we talked about keeping that promise, but to put it pretty clearly in not keeping that promise, it's like, think about someone externally, right? Another person that lies to you every day and just does everything in your worst interest, essentially. Would you ever want to help that person get better? Would you genuinely want to help them? And in these cases, that person is you. So when you go far enough, you're kind of in this hole where, okay, now I have to work to help the person that's been lying to me every single day for however many years. And you know, again, the only way to do that is to keep those promises. You know, th there's a certain level of, you know, we can talk about it all day. You can shift the perspective. You can really have a clear view of it. But when it comes down to it, there is a behavior that has to happen for these things to change. You can recognize it all day long, but as, as far as you boil it down, an action comes after that. And, and keeping that promise is the action 100%.
Yeah. I think if more people could view themselves as from a perspective of, of what if you were your friend, you know, what if you mm-hmm. had a friend who every time you called to go out to lunch, they bailed on you last minute, or you were trying to make them a workout partner. But every time you asked them to come work out, they said, yes, they'll be there. And then they don't show up. Eventually yep. you stop hanging out with that friend, but you are that friend to yourself. When yep. you say, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to eat this meal that is better for me than going out and grabbing a fast food bag. And then you break the agreement with yourself. You are being the bad friend to you. And that is yep. an insane perspective paradigm shift that I took on when I realized that that perspective, it, it, everything changed for me. Like I, I truly believe a lot, a lot of people can find success in the way they view things. And that's one of the things that I love about you is your perspective on the world is challenged by a lot of people, but to the average <laughs> rational person who understands what it's like to live on the other side of, of being healthier, it's, it's totally reasonable. I mean, it's amazing that the, the back, can we talk a little bit about the backlash you catch for eating real food, sleeping eight hours a night, waking up early and not drinking alcohol? What, talk to me about some yeah. of the comments you get. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I, uh, maybe three days ago I was editing my, what I eat in a day video. And the whole time I'm, I'm like, I know what's going to happen with this. Um, <laughs> I mean, you would not believe the anger that comes from a video talking about eating high quality meat, rice, fruit, honey, and dairy. I mean, everybody turns into a nutrition expert and, you know, you're a bad person. <laughs> like that level of hate on a video where I'm just talking about what I eat. I'm like, wow, you know, I, I, people don't really like to hear that someone takes a simple approach, a simple yet very consistent approach and it works for them. And, you know, with all these different things, you know, with the, the video where I say, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do whatever. I mean, that video has 36,000 comments on it. And I mean, maybe 60, 70% are people very angry at me for that. And, you know, what's, what's comforting to me is that I mean, I've never gone on a TikTok or Instagram video and commented something mean. So you have to wonder what is going on in this person's mind where they think, you know, let me let me throw some hate in here. Out of 36,000, this one's going to be worth something. And they think that it's not an advertisement of their own insecurity, which is crazy. You know, because I look at that, I think, wow, this person's obviously unhappy with their situation. So they must let me know that that's the case by saying that my situation is bad. Misery loves company. Great, uh, great quote. I don't know who said it, but someone smart. <laughs> it's true, man. I, I love the the quote from Peter Crone. We're going to use a lot of a lot of aphorisms in this episode, but I love the quote from Peter Crone: "Where you're triggered is your therapist." And if you find something that bothers you or upsets you in a video that's not directed at you sit with that because it's probably attacking yeah. some insecurity or some facet of yourself that you don't like. And when people, you know, I made a video about uh, an electrolyte drink you can make at home. That's like a Pedialyte without sugar. If you have some alcohol, because I had a few cocktails at a wedding and I said, I had yeah. like five or six drinks over the course of a night. And the amount of comments of people who said, bro, you only had six drinks. That's my warm up. Or if you were sober enough to make this video, you weren't drunk. It's like, I, I'm sorry that I don't put poison in my body as regularly yeah. as you, but it affects <laughs> me. So I think once you adopt the perspective and to, to anyone who's on a journey that, of their own, because I believe you're either yeah. on the journey of getting better or you're off. And there are people that are starting to make these changes. And you probably felt this early on. There will be people in your immediate circle. If you're not creating content and putting yourself out there to the masses who will chirp you, who will say negative things to you 9.9999 times out of 10, it is a projection of something they are not happy with in themselves and they are, you are bringing it out of them. So take pity on them. Don't get angry. Uh, I think that that's a very important perspective that you have to uphold, especially when you put yourself out there the way that you do, you open yourself up for jack legs on the internet to say crap like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's just, it's really crazy to see that a video where I'm, I'm essentially defending myself in that video from the exact things that these people comment on that video, which I do that a lot. If, if I have kind of a, a punchier, you know, statement to say in my video, I build in the opposing viewpoint and defend against that. 
And so in that video, I said, I don't drink, I don't smoke, etc. Am I lame for that? Yes. Posing the opposing viewpoint, uh, but to be lame in the eyes of somebody I would never want to be like is nothing but an absolute success. So that person thinking that I'm lame for not doing all those things is successful to me. And all of those negative comments simply reinforced that reality in the comments of that video, which is hilarious. I'm like, yes, you're what I'm talking about. You know? I, I know, I know the exact video you're referencing. I watched that this morning. Um, yeah. that leads me to something, <clears throat> something I want your take on. You're better off failing toward a life you actually want than finding success in a life of knowing you were meant for more to recognize the incomprehensible depth and beauty of human life to then hand yours over to perpetual normacy is a decision I'll never understand. You said that in your day 2014 video. What does that mean to you? Yeah, you know, it, it's um, it's really incredible to me in a negative way to, to see someone treating their life, which, you know, how do you even understand the value of your own life, right? Because you don't know what it's like to not have it, but I think some people are just not enough afraid of that to really take advantage of what they have. Um, you know, and I say to, to hand that over to perpetual normalcy, meaning to just give your entire existence with immense power and depth and value to what you've already seen a million times over is nuts. That is crazy to me. We, we have seen people take the same freaking route and they're, you know, 70, 80, 90 years old. And what do, you, what do you think it feels like to look back when you're at that point? And there's not a thing you can do to change the decision up to that point. There's nothing you can do. And that, that is a crazy position to be in. I don't know what that feels like, but I don't want to know what that feels like because, you know, that's one of the very few things it's the it's the race against time when you're at that point and uh, mm -hmm. to look back on you know all these years you could have turned into something amazing and realizing I wasted it I, I'm I'm pretty fearful of that and I would hope anybody would be fearful of that and that's enough for me to say well you know in the in the scope of 24 hours which is usually the timeline I look at um, I'm going to do everything I can to make this one step forward to where I want to be, not just another day that goes by. Um, and, you know, speaking on that timeline, again, I think a lot of people in the, the entrepreneur or whatever the heck space, it's like, what's your five-year goal? What's your 10-year goal? And to me, I, I don't think about that really ever, because if I am using the scale of 24 hours and doing everything in my power to utilize you know, to take advantage of that, then I shouldn't have to worry about five, 10 years from now, because that's taken care of. And mm -hmm. honestly, if I were to say a five year goal right now, I genuinely, I genuinely believe that would be limiting me. Because how do, it could be way better than my ideal five year from now goal in the current moment. You know, I, I don't know how much better it could be. So I'm not even going to play around with that. But yeah, I like to think in uh, one day at a time. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's a great perspective. I've never even thought about, I've thought about always the importance of having a three or five year plan and setting, I want to make this much money, or I want to build this business, mm -hmm. or I want to change this many lives, but it could be far more if maybe you set an unintentional barrier on yourself. I, I love, I love that perspective. I think yeah. it's also really important for people to adopt that mentality of taking things, especially in the fitness game, you know, that the, the self-improvement game, it's very audacious to look up at a task of you've got 150 pounds to lose, or you've got to run a marathon in six months and you can't even run a mile rather than looking up at the end goal, detach yourself from the outcome and do the behaviors of yourself that you know you're supposed to do anyway. And those results will come over time. But I think that's where people fail is they try to look at the big picture. And this is one of the few times that I personally believe you do yourself a disservice when you look at how far you have to go and rather just look at, the stone in front of you, like the next step you have yep. to take and the rest will yep. sort of uncover itself. No, I like that. Detach yourself from the outcome. That's, I talk about that a lot. Um, 
you know, especially in like my one-on-one settings, because, you know, there always is that big goal. Uh, but if you go into, you know, let's say you go to the gym and you're looking at your ideal body as the ideal outcome. Well, if you go to the gym every day, with that outcome in mind, you're going to be disappointed every single time you go to the gym, which I'm kind of disappointed every single time too. So, you know, you're you're not alone if you feel that way. But um, again, really looking at things of, I'm not going to go in today expecting anything. I'm only going to go into today expecting the best out of my effort, not the best out of an outcome. And if you just keep doing that, And this applies to very simple things. I mean, I, you know, I spent a while trying to uh, learn a wheelie on a bike when I was younger. And, you know, I I would go into every single time wanting to just ride the friggin' street on the back wheel like I know what I'm doing. And every day I would be pissed beyond belief. And, you know, once I just started saying, okay, let me just go practice for a certain amount of time. And then I'm doing my job. You know, I'm doing what needs to be done to get to that point. And that's all you can do. Nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you hit the nail on the head, man. And I think when you do things like that, you're able to practice what you talked about earlier of getting the most out of your life, your body, your mind. I'm going to butcher the quote, but Socrates said something to the effect of it is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty of which his body and mind are capable. And I think there's so much change that can occur inside of you. In my opinion, mostly mentally from doing something Mm -hmm. like running a mile a day for 2000 days or going to the gym every day for 2000 days. The physical byproduct is just a happy side effect, but the way that you change as an individual, and I'm sure you've experienced this from just the sheer, the sheer monotony, the embracing of the monotony of doing what you do. There is such a callousing of the mind and a confidence development that I honestly can't explain. It's one of yeah. those things you know, I can't explain. I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. You just have to go out there and do it yourself. So has that, what would you say the biggest change you've experienced inside of the things that you do daily has been the most noticeable to you in your daily life? You know, I, I really think it comes down to confidence and that's obviously an oversimplification. Uh, but I mean, you talk about the monotony of it, you know, it's, never glamorous you know there's maybe a couple times where I'm out there just you know giddy and laughing and just excited you know it's difficult all the time and that's what people don't understand because it's it's a video on their phone and I'm you know a character in this scope of you know the for you page or whatever else it is but you know I'm out there with my hand you know pins and needles holding my phone in the cold trying to get this video you know it's it's not glamorous. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to do. The ice bath is before that's worse than running by far. Um, it's, <laughs> oh my God, dude, it's so bad. I, like, you know, and it's bad I, I, every time it really never gets that much easier. Never dude, never. And, and you know, this, this leads into one of my favorite points about building that type of mindset is you're not going to change the thing that you're worrying about. You know, someone just got broken up with, someone got in an argument, uh, you know, some whatever, anything in that regard. You're not going to change that person or that thing that happened to you, but you can change your own reaction to that thing. And the ice bath is just the best example of that possible. You're, you're not going to change how piercingly cold the water you're sitting in is but you can absolutely change your response to that feeling. You know, you go into the gym day one, you're not going to pull 400 pounds off the floor, but you go for three, four years in a row, that might be part of your warm up. And did the weight on the bar change? No, but your tolerance to that weight on the bar changed. Same exact thing with these overwhelming things that happen to us mentally, emotionally, et cetera. You know, are, are the reality of those things happening ever going to change? No, there's always going to be those external uh, things that are going to happen to us, but you can change your own ability to bear the weight of that just as you can a physical weight. 
Yeah, man. That's that's something that I think a lot of the gym bros and the people in the fitness community that when they speak negatively of something like cold exposure or daily ice baths, there's not a lot of research to support it or this, that, and the other. What it's really about is changing your relationship to stress. And it, yeah. I have a cold plunge on my back deck. I take a cold shower daily. I have noticed a direct correlation in my ability or lack thereof to get worked up or anxious or stressed because you know, at a scientific level, our brain recognizes there is stress or there is no stress. It doesn't necessarily recognize what it's coming from. You know, you could be hopping in ice cold water or you could have rent due and you're not going to know how to pay it. The same neurotransmitters and chemicals are released in our brain that trigger these stress responses. And by exposing yourself to these extreme stressors, like 35 degree water for three minutes, you change your relationship with stress. And again, a level that really can't be explained, only experienced. And not to mention, in honor of, of doing this podcast with you today, I woke up at five, I did a couple mile run, and then hopped hey. in the coldest, the coldest ice bath I have done in my two years of cold exposure. And I even Heck recorded yeah. a, a running while you talk video and posted it on TikTok in honor of you. Oh, shoot. You, yeah, dude. I, was, I, I, I figured I had to do something in honor of, and I could not go into this podcast not razor sharp, which is what I was going to talk about for just a second before we move into your, your daily protocol. Yeah. The sharpness mentally that you feel after you've run, even if it's just a mile, you go out, you get your heart rate up for 15, 20, 30 minutes. You hop in ice cold water. Then maybe you have a cup of coffee afterward. I, you are dialed to a degree. Nothing can bother you that day. So talk about that. Wow. I mean, do, have you noticed an elevation in your well being, your mental acuity after the morning mile and cold plunge, even all these days later or all these years later? Oh my God. I mean, it, it's every single day. It's an event, which when I wake up, you know, it, it's a lot to, it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to digest, you know, the, the alarm goes off and, you know, I'm, I'm obviously in the routine, but there's no ignoring what I'm about to do. Uh, and you know, I, I, I have an indoor ice bath or whatever. So to keep the water clean, I shower off real quick beforehand and then go do that. Um, but, you know, I wake up cold most mornings just because, you know, I think my body's just uh, preparing for what's what's to come, uh, get in the shower, and then the contrast of getting out of the shower, cold again, walk downstairs, and, you know, within 25 minutes or so of waking up, uh, I'm in the old ice bath, and three minutes in there, you know, it, it's just it's insane. Right. And then all that I'm thinking I'm about to have to go run. And this morning it was 28 out and, yeah, same uh, here. yeah, yeah. So, you know, you go right out the ice bath, dry off. And then, you know, I read over what I want to talk about and all that fun stuff. And then I'm out the door and, and you, you go through this whole gauntlet of emotion and overcoming that. And you keep, you know, cutting that wire of resistance in your mind and then you get back and it's still dark out and I'll just like sit in a chair and, and just be overwhelmed with how happy I am to just be sitting in that chair, having done everything I just did. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. Just the, Oh my God, mm -hmm. how, you know, and it's that every day, you know, you want to, you want to talk about just exposing yourself to, contrast therapy not only physically but a mental contrast therapy i mean th there's nothing better than that there's nothing that gives you more clarity uh there's nothing that makes you more grateful for that current moment it's it's insane but you know you have to do everything leading up to that point to be able to feel that point and you know if i want to feel that every single day have to do that every single day and you know, once you do, how can you not? It's why I love the con. Yeah, exactly. Once you do it, once you feel what it's like on this side, you don't yeah. want to regress back to the other side. But it's it's the yeah. concept that I love of earning your dopamine. The feeling at 7 a.m. this morning after I had run a couple miles, hopped in the cold plunge outside. So when I got out of the cold plunge, it was freezing. The water was freezing on my body. And yeah. then I got inside, I warmed up, and I hopped in the shower to just get, get cleaned off. And I just was looking staring into the shower curtain thinking i feel so good and even all those yeah. years later of doing this stuff i still get that earned dopamine hit and everybody everybody can do that you know getting cold yeah. this time of year is free going out for a run is free go run a mile come back get in a cold shower 
and tell me you don't feel 180 degrees different or better than you did when you started yeah. this. I mean, it's, it's really a powerful, it's a powerful way to totally change your brain yeah. and your physiology. I think it's amazing. Now, yeah. one of the things I wanted to ask you about is on day, <clears throat> day 2000, you made the video, your morning mile, and you talked briefly about, you know, surely it was something to the effect of surely it wasn't smooth sailing along the way. Sure. There was definitely adversity. 2000 days. There's no way it's, every day is going to be great. And another yeah. thing you alluded to is people see you as this character, right? They see you for 30 seconds on their for you page when they, when they are still lying in bed, opening their eyes and scrolling TikTok, And they see you for a brief second, but what they don't see is the freezing hands. The other 30 minutes, you may be out there, the preparing mentally. What would you say have been the biggest adversities you've faced in those 2000 days? Could be one, two, three things. And how did you overcome from them? How did you overcome them? And, and what did you learn as a result? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's five years, right? So I mean, it, it, you go five years, some things are going to happen. Um, you know, whether it was getting broken up with or, you know, being injured. I mean, I've had like quad tendonitis for about four years or so from being a psycho squat guy. Um, you know, just countless things like that. I mean, you know, had COVID, I, I was in the hospital one night and woke up. I'll tell you this, the biggest adversity I have faced in doing all this was one day where I didn't wake up at five. I woke up at like 640 because I was, I had gone to the hospital for like a back nerve issue till like 2am. And then somehow like I was at my mom's house and sleeping on the couch and my phone was next to me, which it never is. And I like woke up and turned the alarm off and accidentally like fell back asleep and was up, you know, 640 or something. That was probably the worst day I can remember just because, you know, four and a half years before that, leading up to that day, I hadn't not woken up at five once. Uh, and and well, so be a tough feeling. Yeah, you know, that, that was probably the biggest dose in a long time of not showing up for me how I would have wanted to. And, you know, obviously made my video that day and expressed that and everyone's like, that that's such a realistic excuse. Like, you know, you can't blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but think of how sick it would have been if I did do it, given that excuse, because that's what I love. You know, you wake up and you see it's pouring rain. I'm like, yeah, son. I mean, what, what am I going to not go out there and do it? No, I'm going to do it. I know that a hundred percent. And it's going to be cool to see how I feel when I'm inevitably out there doing it. And yeah, I mean that that's probably one of the hardest days I can remember. Um, and it wasn't, you know, one of these external things. It was a me versus me thing. And when you get so far into keeping those promises, being consistent, never letting yourself down, and then you do, th that's a pretty hard hit to take. Um, and, you know, of course, nobody's perfect, but I, I don't look at these things in terms of perfection or innate ability. I look at them as the undeniable ability to show up given external factors. Um, yeah, that was, that was a tough one for me. That, that was, that was real difficult. I can imagine. And imagine, yeah. and then on top of that, the morning mile with the nerve pain was probably not the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. It, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It, well, I was on a flight, uh, and once I got back in the hospital and that, all that realized I had COVID, but, I wasn't there because of the COVID. I was there because I threw up in the bathroom on the airplane and some and pulled something in my back. Holy uh, moly. And that was kind of the, the reason for the whole hospital visit and all that fun stuff. But yeah, by the next morning, it was fine. But looking back on it, which I try not to dwell on it too much. It was quite a long time ago. I think it's already been over a year since that point. Um, so, you know, well back on track after my one day of being angry, but, uh, I could have just hopped in the ice bath that probably would have fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is a bit of a cure all for some things. Yeah. You know, might've done the trick, but yeah, the, the, the point you made about, uh, someone saying that's a perfectly valid excuse. And you said, but how sick would it have been to have done it anyway? There's a great concept I've heard Alex Hormozzi talk about, which is you can have certain circumstances stacked against you that are totally against your control. You're born into poverty. You're born 
you know, in a family that has no history or track record of success, or you're trying to go train or run outside and it's 28 degrees and pouring down rain, or you can succeed and do all those things in spite of the circumstances, even though your yeah. excuse would be perfectly justifiable and reasonable, but it would be sick to do it anyway. Right. So <laughs> I love that concept shifting a little bit. Can we talk about your approach to your training, your nutrition and your overall wellness protocol? Cause you have a very minimalist approach, no supplements, yeah. just real food, yeah. barbell training, the way the good Lord intended. So at a high level, walk us through your training, the way you work out, the way you train, what you eat, how and why, and then maybe some of the additional things you do just to feel as good as possible, like the cold plunge. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny because, you know, I'm kind of the the running guy or whatever on, on Instagram and TikTok, but I'm much more of a lifter. You know, I spend a high majority of my fitness training lifting. So I'm actually on a powerlifting program right now because essentially uh, – I'm like addicted to doing legs in a way, and that doesn't agree too well with my quad tendon <laughs> and uh, actual progress in lifting heavy weight. So I figure, you know, let me get on a powerlifting program. Not that it's not going to be super difficult, but it's going to hold me back in the right ways because, you know, I got to a point I was squatting every single day, uh, no matter what the rest of my workout was, just because it's awesome. And, uh, yeah, so I've, you know, been trying to refine a more conservative approach to lifting and all that fun stuff. Um, I think having a program for somebody who's really ambitious physically is helpful, uh, because again, it'll hold you back in the ways that are necessary. Cause you know, I mean, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, either squatting or deadlifting, and then following that with sort of a bodybuilding style lift, uh, your CNS does not really recover. You never feel great to go in and deadlift and squat. And so transitioning from that is going to be pretty great. But, you know, the, the basis of how I work out would be starting with a power lift, typically a squat, deadlift, or bench, and then following that with, again, kind of a, a bodybuilding style accessory workout. I've I've been condensing it a little more lately. So, you know, I used to be doing – six or seven different things. I probably do three or four different things now. Um, but the goal at the moment is to get thick. So, you know, I have to resist the urge to do some of the longer cardio and uh, yep. high intensity type of stuff just to try and, you know, get a little stocky, you know, yeah, 195, yeah. 200 would be kind of nuts. So <laughs> I'm, I'm working towards the same goal. I'm going for two oh. I'm pursuing 205 right now, 200. My weight has not started with a two since before I got lean when I was a fat boy. Yeah. Uh, and, and my goal is to do that and to not become too much of a pudge ball in the process. But I had to drop my right mileage now? too. I'm, I'm morning weight. I'm about 196. So I'm up okay. 10 pounds from ultra marathon day when I, when I did the 33 miler. And I noticed first off, I got my blood work done and my test, my testosterone was okay. It was average. Uh, yeah. But I know that there's a pretty acute effect in, in endurance training and long runs and it declining testosterone levels. So I've had to cut back the mileage myself, just running, you know, 10 miles a week tops, just in case yeah. I want to train for something and get in shape. But I will say, you've probably noticed this when you hop onto that calorie surplus, and I know you're eating like 4,000 calories a day, sometimes more of just yeah. real whole foods, which is impressive and a feat in and of itself. You, uh, your, your capacity for energy and strength in the gym when you're running less is just through the roof, dude. It's, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, you know, to speak on the calories thing, that is, it's rough, man. I mean, you know, two pounds of beef every single day. It, it's not, there are no free calories. I'll tell you that. So, I mean, I'm, <laughs> you know, half the time I'll be eating my dinner for like an hour. It, it's just, it's incredible, you know, but uh, it it's all good stuff. And that's why I like to stick to a very minimalist uh variety of what I do eat because, you know, it, it's the best quality stuff. I don't have to worry about, you know, this, this wager of, Oh, how many of these can I have? Or how much of this can I have? I eat as much as my happiness can sustain these days. And, you know, I'm still lean. I can't, I can't gain weight to save my life. You know, I've been trying to hit 190 for about uh, 23 years now and uh, just now <laughs> hit it kind of 
you know, a week ago. And I mean, you know, 4,000, 4,500 calories for months and months and months and just the slowest progress you could imagine. <laughs> Dude, it's a testament though to anyone who's out there listening to this, who's 50, a hundred pounds overweight and has tried tracking calories. If it fits your macros, different approaches to eating. If you just eat real food, it is so hard to overdo it. If you two pounds of beef a day, that'll put you easily at 180, 190 grams of protein. It's going to be so filling. And you eat, you eat a lot of just, well, only real food that is very tough to overconsume. Whole food calories, like you said, you can eat pretty much to happiness and you're yeah. not in a thousand calorie surplus every day. It'll be very difficult wow. to do. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. What you mentioned two yeah. pounds of beef. What are your, your staple foods that you have every single day that you love? Yeah. Uh, beef and rice. I enjoy it. Maybe not in the quantity that I'm trying to consume it at the current moment. Um, you know, if I was just throwing down money, I would be eating, you know, some high quality ribeyes every day. That's the, that's definitely the ideal. So, you know, I'll get dream. to that point a hundred percent, but you know, the, the ground beef is definitely the way to go. I do the eighty five fifteen a little more fat content, obviously the grass fed organic, all that good stuff. Um, I use white rice. I did brown for a long time and I heard there's higher, uh, concentration of arsenic like heavy That's metals correct. in the brown rice um, brown rice is a fake health food for those of you who swap brown for white because you think it's better go on yeah yeah <laughs> so i do the white rice uh cook the beef in you know grass-fed butter all that good stuff season with salt and pepper that's it um and then the only other thing is the smoothie that i have in the morning so i'll do strawberries banana kiwi orange juice milk i do kefir as well which is not great on its own, but in the smoothie, it's pretty, pretty sweet. And then, uh, I'll do a couple raw eggs in there, but yeah, I mean, eggs are great too. Uh, I'll, if I'm hungry, which I never am anymore, I'll, you know, cook maybe three or four extra after the smoothie as a, as a breakfast thing. But yeah, other than that, it's, it's beef and rice and fruit, get some honey in there, drink a bunch of milk. And that's, that's what I'm working with right now. <laughs> And if you just, you, you eat those few things every single day for the people listening, wondering what about his vegetables? He's getting plenty of fiber. You're addressing pretty much every micronutrient from the red meat to the yolks of the eggs raw, yeah. meaning the raw egg yolk is extremely bioavailable to our bodies. Um, and then the fruits, you've got micronutrients in the fruits, you've got fiber in the fruits. I mean, you are covering all the bases from a macronutrient and a micronutrient perspective. I eat the exact same way, dude. I've been eating a beef and rice meal my, my go-to, if you ever want to swap it up, I do beef, white rice. I'll add an avocado because I just love uh -huh. meat, rice, and avocado. And then I'll hit it with some, this is going to sound strange, but bear with me. Raw honey, a hot sauce of your choosing, and a little bit of soy sauce. It's sort of like a an Asian sweet and spicy. And I yeah. I have been eating that meal weekly for three years now. I can't get enough of it. Yeah, that's, that's some good stuff, bro, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I, have a, I do a... Um, I know a guy who has a bee, whatever the heck. He, he sells local raw honey, basically. So uh, I buy that. I would love to get to the next level and do the raw milk if it wasn't illegal to sell in North Carolina, which is stupid as can be. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of farms and stuff will do – they sell it as pet milk or whatever, but then it's $13 a gallon. I'm like, all right, let's yep. chill out. <laughs> I found I found a farm that has raw milk in my area and it's 14 bucks for a gallon. But in California, you can just buy it at Sprouts or Whole Foods. It's it's I absurd. Know. But are I there know. are there any other like wellness things that you do or things that are a non-negotiable in your day that have, you've noticed have made you feel dramatically better? Mm. I think it's got really the cold exposure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously the ice bath, that's a huge one. Um there's the physical benefits, but again, I think it's the little bit of mental resilience, overcoming something difficult. That's, that's what it is for me. Um, I'm trying to think of some of my other good non-negotiables. A, a funny one, since I was like 13, uh, I do three pull-ups every time I go in and out of my room, like no exceptions. Uh, and maybe the past five, six years, I've done it with like a 25-pound <clears throat> weight belt. So... <clears throat> that's what I do every time. 
Holy cow. That's a hell of a promise. Have you ever ballparked how many pull-ups you've done as a result of that? I haven't. I guess I go in my room pretty minimally as a result. Like when I was living with my mom, uh, like she kind of knew the deal, but I'd be like, can you go get me a sweatshirt from my room? <laughs> and she'd be like, do you need anything? I'd be like, yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> Intentionally avoiding the pull-ups. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh yeah, that's a funny one, but it's it's such a habit, you know, and honestly being 23 and like having this little jungle gym on the edge of my bedroom door and like a weight belt on the ground, I'm like this is kind of just stupid as hell, but this is funny and I'm going to keep doing it. So, yeah, in, in a way we're just living like like big kids. We're just eating yeah. what makes us happy. We're doing things in the pursuit of just feeling as good as possible. It's like living like a big kid. You just make different decisions, which is something you said earlier. I love that. I want to call back to, I always say in my videos, you are four or five decisions every day away from feeling 180 degrees different and looking 180 yeah. degrees different. And I know this is a random callback, but it just, it popped into my mind that most people don't understand that the way they feel and the way they look is simply a byproduct of their choices. And it's really just going left when they should go right. Or, yeah. you know, zig when they should zag it's these small things that, that they can do in their day that don't have to be they don't have to be as extreme as what we're doing now because we certainly didn't start with what we're doing now we started smaller yeah. we started with a 30-day mile challenge i started by just understanding what what protein was and why it was important and why calories kind of matter and you begin to stack the knowledge through your choices through your decisions to learn and in that process you transform um and i want to ask you to, to bring things to a close here, the big question, which is what's your why? I mean, why do you really do this? Why, why wake up at 5 a.m. every day for 2000 days and record what you're doing briefly for everybody yeah. else to see? That's not for you. That's for everybody else. Why make content? Why coach people? Why, why be obsessed with the journey of continuous self-improvement? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it comes down to the fact that seeing other people just accept the limitations of everyone and everything else for themselves arbitrarily. That is wild to me. That That's something that has never made sense to me. And if there's anything I can do to tell somebody that they don't need to do that, then that's my why. That's my goal. You know, I, I grew up hearing people constantly, oh, you're going to do this. You're going to be like this. You're going to no. know. Why, why would that be the case? You know, I'd hear when you complain about nap time when you're six years old in kindergarten, oh, you're going to want nap time when you're this old. No, I don't want nap time. I have sleep time and then I want to be doing things during the day because I like the point that I've gotten to. I like what I spend my energy on. Oh, when you're 21, you're going to drink. No, I'm actually not because I don't feel compelled by everyone else doing something to, to where that makes me want to do it. That's not my reason for things. More so, I'm averse to doing things that everybody does because do I want to be like everybody? No. So if everyone does something, maybe there's maybe there's a change that should be considered. You know, it, it's just seeing person after person give in to that prescribed BS, you're going to be like this, here's your you know, maximum effort. Here's the best your life could be. I hate it because, you know, I recognize that I'm not better than anybody else, but I also recognize that nobody else is inherently better than me. I say that a lot because the fact is if I see somebody that has an awesome life, they have a great mind and, you know, they're physically impressive. They have awesome relationships, a successful business, whatever it is, why on earth could that not be me? That person made choices to be where they are. Why could I not make those same choices to get to that point or my version of that point? You know, so it, it definitely gets me fired up because this is something I've been very aware of for a long time, you know, and the proof of the current moment often is not enough to prove to other people that that's how you think and that that makes sense. And, and you got to stick to it long enough to achieve that and say, see, you know, at 14, I couldn't explain to the person telling me, 
oh, you're going to drink when you're 21 that no, I'm not because they think that I'm stupid. They think that I'm going to change. They think that everyone else's opinion changes what I do. And so you have to wait, what is it, seven years till you're 21 from 14 to say, okay, well, here, I didn't do it. What, what's your next thing? Oh, you know, it's a lot harder when you're 30, whatever. There are people that are at their absolute peak at 30, 40, because they look at their life as a constant improvement. If I saw right now that things were going to start going downhill, what's the point of continuing my life? You know what I mean? I, I see every day as a continuation of my progress. And wh why would you not see that a as a reflection of what your life is? So, um, you know, hopefully that, that gives a little insight into why I do these things. I think it's really important to recognize. What a powerful way to end it, man. The, the, what if, if people were telling me this is as good as it was going to get and it's all down here from hill, downhill from here, what would be the point of continuing is such a great way to look at it because a lot of people say, you know, your twenties is it, this is the best time of your life. And then it's all downhill from here. Why? Yeah. Because you chose it to be. And that, that's really what I believe is that every day we choose to be average or be excellent every day we choose to make our life better or worse. And every day we choose to move forward or regress. So I think you brought a hell of a perspective to, to close out the questioning, to, to wrap things up here, man, it, feel for, is there anything you're, you're doing any big challenges you're taking on anything you're trying to build? I know you've got a great podcast boy dinner on Spotify. Uh, Heck yeah. anything you want to plug or anything you want to take on that you want to share, I'd, I'd love to hear it. And I'm sure the people would too. Oh man, you know, I, I think really what it comes down to for me is again, that, that 24 hour scope of looking at things. So, you know, tomorrow I'm looking to be a little bit better than today. Um, you know, I, I'm really trying to build out the business behind what I'm doing and be able to help people specifically with what they're going through. You know, people get value from my videos and things, but you know, when I can really look at someone's situation, talk to them one on one and make a difference in their life, that's wildly rewarding to me. And it's it, it's really helpful for somebody to be able to receive that. So, you know, doing the coaching, building out programs, you know, having more resources for people to realize the message that I was talking about before, um, you know, it's it's all kind of a system, you know, so uh, I'm putting out a newsletter. So for people that don't want to be scrolling on on Instagram and TikTok to watch the videos. You know, you can still receive the messages that I say in my Daily Mile videos. Um, so all that stuff, you know, you can find it on my Instagram or my website, crewmahoney.com. But yeah, it, it's all in there. So do what you will with that. <laughs> awesome, brother. Thank you, man. For those of you who don't follow him, which if you follow me, you probably follow Crew too. His socials are Crew, C-R-U, Mahoney on TikTok and Instagram, right? Podcast, yep. Boy Dinner on Spotify. Yep, you got it. Cool, man. Well, dude, this was a pleasure. This was a great first guest episode. I was honored to have you. And, you know, here's to maybe doing another one in the future. Absolutely, man. Looking forward to it. Cool, brother. Thanks. All right. You got it.